Maulana Abul Kalam Azhar is a name to reckon with. He was not only a great politician and a patriot, but he had a vision and he was an impartial thinker. My subject today is the partition of India as documented in Maulana Abul Kalam Azad's India Wins Freedom. The title of the book India Wins Freedom is something to be considered. We all know that Azad himself was one of the leaders of India's struggle for freedom. In fact, in the drama that was being enacted in 1940s and especially in the years immediately prior to the independence of India, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad was a very significant personality. I shall be focusing particularly on these chapters of the book. General Elections, the British Cabinet Mission, the Prelude to Partition, Interim Government, the Mountbatten Mission, and finally, the End of a Dream. The dream was the freedom of India, united India, and not divided India. Polona Azad has meticulously, thoroughly, and impartially shown how and why finally India had to be partitioned. What were the circumstances that led to the partition of India? Who were the persons that may be held responsible, responsible substantially or partially for the partition of India? It is said that when one is inside the circle, it is difficult to look at this circle impartially. So the question we raised, how could Azad look at these incidents so impartially when he was inside the circle, when he was himself an actor in the drama? The answer is that he was writing this book 10 years after the partition and a man of his reason, thinking ability and integrity after a span of 10 years could definitely Look at those incidents with impartiality. It is true that during the publication, the first publication of his book, 
he instructed that some passages were to be eliminated for the present and he also instructed that those passages could be inserted in the book the new edition after 30 years of his death very unfortunately Bola Nazad could not see the book in print he died But the man who was collaborating with Azad for the writing of this book was Professor Humayun Kobi. And Professor Kobi tells us that. Azad wanted to give a subtitle India wins freedom an autobiographical narrative it's truly it is an autobiographical narrative because these incidents were a part of very important part of Azad's life. Azad was a man who was in many respects much ahead of the other people of his community. And therefore, before we go into the main discussion, I think we should spare a few minutes to say a few words about the early life of Maulana Abul Karam Azad. In fact, Azad was a name that he took upon himself. It was a pen name. Azad means freedom. And Maulana wanted to have freedom of thought. He wanted to free himself from all narrowness. Abul Kalam was educated in Madrasa as was the custom of the day for the Muslims but he could understand that it was necessary to learn English language and to be familiar with Western thoughts, Western philosophy. He had the power to go over the narrowness of prejudice that English education might weaken his Islamic foundation. That was Maulana Azam. In his book, Azad discusses so many things, but as I've said, my focus will be on the partition of India. Now, Azad very meticulously 
presents his materials, trying to make the whole thing clear to the readers. Now, first of all, I shall summarize the points that Azad has made in his book and then I shall try to make my comments. The Indian National Congress was established in 1885. But unfortunately, the Muslim representation in the Indian National Congress was minimal. The Muslims were not thinking of the freedom of the country. They were mostly worried about their own predicament and in 1906 the Muslim League was set up and primarily the purpose of the Muslim League was to be closer to the British government, to try to have more opportunities for the Muslims as regards government job and the British took this opportunity to play their Muslim card. They wanted to place the Muslims as a counter against the Indian National Congress. Azad, while visiting the Arab countries and Turkey, came in contact with the freedom fight fighters there, the revolutionaries there, and the revolutionaries there told Azad that the Indian Muslims should also join the struggle for independence. The Indian Muslims should make them a part of the struggle for freedom. But initially, the Muslim League had been playing only as a close ally or associate of the British government. The situation in 1946, as you can see there in the board, may be represented through this graph. The INC or the Indian National Congress had primarily three men at the helm, Nehru, Patel and Mahatma Gandhi. And Muslim League had as their leaders these two men, Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Leah Katali. Azad was standing 
in between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, trying to mediate. And Maulana Azad issued a statement in 1946, which was a very crucial one. And we have to take note of that. In this statement, he categorically said that the formation of Pakistan would be only harmful for the Muslims. As a great thinker, he could see things from before. He said that India is a country where Muslims live in different parts and if there is a division of India on the basis of religion only those parts where Muslims are a majority will be considered as the possible land for Pakistan. But there are many other parts in India where many Muslims live, but there Muslims are not the majority. So those parts will be very much in the Indian territory. So what will happen to the Muslims in India? They will be considered a minority in a country where the other communities will form the majority. But if India remains undivided, the total population of the Muslims will be substantial and that substantial total Muslim population will have a stronger voice than the depleted voice of the minority Muslims. So the partition of India will not be beneficial for the Muslims in general, at least for the predominantly majority sections of the Muslims. This was his first point. And then he said that the concept of Pakistan is itself anti-Islamic because Pakistan means the Holy Land. That suggests that a part of the land is holy and the other part is unholy. Now that is something grossly against what the Prophet had said. The Prophet had said that God has given the whole planet as a mosque. The whole planet, the earth, is a mosque to him. So if that be Prophet's statement, then how can we agree to the fact that a part is holy and the other parts are unholy. He also commented on the ongoing communal bitterness. And he emphatically said that the ongoing communal bitterness was a temporary phase. The Hindus and the Muslims and other communities, they had been living on the same land 
for centuries and the temporary bitterness would go. So the Muslims in general and the Muslim League in particular should not press for a separate land. And he also talked about the Jew questions. The Jews wanted a homeland. So if the Muslims wanted a homeland for them, that would be a defeatist kind of an attitude. Well, the issue with the Jews were different because the Jews believed in a scattered way in different parts of the world. And therefore, they demanded a particular land for them where all the Jews from all over the world would be settled. But the Muslims in India had been living for centuries. So what can they mean by saying that they wanted a homeland? So do they suggest that the land where they had been living for hundreds of years was not their homeland? That will be definitely something which would go against them. And this statement, issued by Maulana Azhar, is so important. The educated Muslims, the liberal Muslims, perhaps many of them could understand that. But the other forces were at work. Now before we come to this point, further, I have to talk about something else. I have to begin from the end of the Second World War. The Second World War ended and There was general elections in, in, in England, in Great Britain and the Labour Party or the Liberal Party had a thumping victory. And after the victory of the Labour Party, it was believed, it was hoped by the Indians that perhaps an attitude to the Indian people and their country would change and perhaps the British, the British government would more seriously think of the independence of India. For negotiations with the Indian representatives, the British Cabinet Commission was sent to India and the Indian National Congress, the Muslim League representatives, they were holding talks with the cabinet commission and the representatives of the Indian National Congress suggested several points which they thought would appease the anxiety of the Muslims. They said that the prospective central government or rather the prospective government of India would have a federal structure where the provinces would enjoy greater powers than the center. The center would be there to just hold the provinces together but the provinces would take up the majority of issues and 
the Muslim majority provinces would definitely look after the interests of the Muslims and there and the Hindu majority or Sikh majority provinces would be looking after the interests of others. In fact, only three subjects will lie with the center. Home, foreign and defense issues would be looked after by the central government. All other issues, all other issues would be in the charge of the provincial governments. They suggested the Congress representatives thus tried to suggest that the Muslims should have no uncertainties after the independence because the Muslims would rule themselves. So that Patel, of course, suggested that finance should be in the hands of the central government. But it was decided that that could be taken up later. Now we let us remember that the president of the Indian National Congress at that time was Maulana Abu Kalamaza. In fact, from 1940 to 46, he was in the office of the president of the Indian National Congress and he was negotiating. Mamad Ali Jinnah, as the representative of the Muslim League, disapproved of all the proposals and he insisted that the Muslims should have a separate land for them. But the British Cabinet Commission was very firm over the fact that they would grant independence only to the unified India and they would not brook any partition whatsoever. So no option was left with Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the Muslim League and finally both the Congress and the League accepted the proposal of the British Cabinet Commission. And that was a day of victory for the people of India. And in fact, Muhammad Ali Jinnah himself accepted that there could be no better solution to the problem. But then, as Ajad suggests, says, in fact, admits that he committed a blunder. In 1946, he wanted to leave the post of the President of the Indian National Congress. He wanted somebody else to be the President now. There were people, they were friends of Azad and other people who insisted that Azad should stay as the President till the final settlement is made, till the point of the independence. But Polana Azad did not want to continue for various reasons perhaps. 
maybe one of the reasons was his health. But this was a custom that the outgoing president had to nominate the name of the new president. And two names were there. One was the name of Sardar Patel, the other was Jawaharlal Nehru. Now, Jawaharlal Nehru was Azad's friend. Although Azad in the book has spoken of some of the weaknesses of Jawaharlal Nehru, but he admits that he was a friendly man, a scholarly man, and a man good at heart. Maulana Azad had a prejudice against Sardar Patel, maybe because Sardar Patel was a bit prejudiced. He was not, according to Azad, an open-hearted man. So, Azad recommended the name of Nehru as the next president of the Indian National Congress. And that was the greatest blunder that he could ever commit. Because Nehru, after being the president, issued a statement which unsettled all the good works that had been done for so many years and days. The statement that Nehru made after being the president of the Indian National Congress was that the Congress party could alter, omit, or modify any part of the recommendations of the British government, Cabinet Commission. And this was taken up by Mahmud Ali Jinnah as an issue, as an opportunity. The Indian National Congress and the Muslim League both agreed to uphold the recommendations of the Commission. And now the President of the Indian National Congress was talking of something which was contrary to the resolution that was taken then. Taken then. And Mahmud Ali Jinnah began his fresh agitation to press for a separate land. Maulana Azad came into the scene and he tried to save the situation. He, wa he wanted that a fresh statement should be issued and in that statement it would be said that the opinion of Jawaharlal Nehru was his personal opinion and that was not the opinion of the Congress party. And when Jawaharlal was told that such a statement would be issued, Jawaharlal felt greatly aggrieved and he said that that would be insulting for him. The situation where the party and the president are not seeing eye to eye would only mean that the president should go. So Jawaharlal did not agree 
to apologize or say sorry for the statement that he issued and in spite of all the efforts of Murana Azad, it was evident that things were slipping off their hands. Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Liyakat Ali, as if we were given a fresh lease of life. And a fresh opportunity to press for the division of India, a separate state for the Muslims. In the interior government formed by the Congress, the Muslim League was also inducted as a partner and uh, the finance portfolio was given to Liyakat Ali. Now, Liyakat Ali was opposing Sardar Patel at every point. He was exercising his veto at every point. And even the issue of provincial groupings which was decided at the cabinet mission became a subject of, subject of controversy. Sardar Patel was exasperated. In the meantime, Wavell left and Lord Mountbatten came as the Supremo, the Governor General. And Mountbatten wanted to end this problem very quickly. Mulan Abul Kalam Azad has pointed out that Mount Button was asked by his authorities to round off everything by the month of June 1948. So perhaps he was in a hurry. And he suggested to Patel that he should agree to the partition. And Patel, as I said, was exasperated because of continuous opposition by the Muslim League, by Liyakat Ali and it was impossible, rather impossible for him to move, to make any progress, to make, to take any decision, any concrete or tangible decision. So perhaps he thought that it would be better to agree to the partition and get rid of the Muslim. And Azad says, he writes in his book, that it should be put on record that Sardar Patel was the first man who agreed to the partition of India. Jawaharlal initially was reluctant, but finally he too agreed. And then everyone had to look to Mahatma Gandhi. Perhaps he could save the situation. And he said that he would not allow any partition of India. The partition of India 
could come only on his dead body. He would die first and then allow the partition of India. But what happened in the closed door meeting with Mountbatten? We do not know. After the two hour meeting between Mountbatten and Mount Ma Gandhi, Gandhi came and it was found that he too agreed to the partition of India. And then last nail on the coffin of undivided India was driven home. It was destined that India had to be partitioned. And what happened immediately after the partition is known to all of us. The story of bloodbath, the story of the murder of the millions of Muslims and Hindus, the story of the torture on, on, on women of both the Muslim community and the Hindu community, the untold miseries that the people had to suffer on both parts of the country. This is a known fact. And this definitely is an outcome of the decision to partition India. Now, a few words I want to say here in this connection. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad candidly narrated the incidents leading to the partition of India. He was a man of guts, a man of courage, who could say directly that Patel was the first man who agreed to the partition of India. And even he did not waver to cast a mild aspersion on Gandhi, on Mahatma Gandhi, when he says that what happened in the closed door meeting is not known. But Gandhi agreed. Now the question is, was it really possible to have an undivided India? Now, Sardar Patel had his own thoughts. In fact, this was definitely a foolish thought on the part of Sardar Patel, but he thought that Pakistan would never be able to retain herself as a country for long and Pakistan would be obliged, would be compelled to come and join India territory and be a part of India once again. Perhaps Sardar Patel was thinking of the biblical story, the, the parable of the prodigal son. The Muslim League was the prodigal son and wanted to have its share and go away. But finally the prodigal son has to come back to the father and be united with the father. But this was foolish thought on the part of Patel. Because if a country once becomes independent and when the country is recognized by a number of countries in the world, it is difficult if not impossible. to have such a thought that the country will no longer remain and it would 
be compelled to come back and join India. It is true perhaps that Patel was exasperated. That Muslim League became unbearable. But still they could have waited. They could have waited for some more months, some more years. Yes, Mountbatten of the British government, they were in a hurry. But why should the Indians be in a hurry? Why in a hurry they committed such a blunder? One thing which Maulana Azad did not mention is perhaps very true that the leaders both of the Muslim League and of the Indian National Congress became a bit too eager to taste the flavor of power and therefore they did not wait and agreed to the partition. Baba Dali Jinnah was suffering from tuberculosis, but nobody knew that. Jawaharlal did not know it, Patel did not know it, Bolan Azad did not know it. So what was going on in the mind of Baba Dali Jinnah? Did he want to immortalize his name as the founder of a new country without thinking of the consequences? And when, Pat, when Azad was writing this book, ten years had passed after, after the partition and Azad, Azad says that even in these ten years there has been no election in Pakistan. So it will not be, it will not be wrong to think that the leaders of the Muslim League wanted to taste the flavor of power. Although perhaps they had scant knowledge of administration, they didn't know how to administer the country. Finally, I shall echo what Mola Razad has said about the basis of the partition. What was the basis of the partition? Can religion be the basis of partition? This is a question which is being raised now. But prophetically, Mohana Nazad could think of it, not only think of it, in frank and in a free voice, he has ventilated his thoughts, he has written down his thoughts in the book that when there are differences galore, linguistic differences, cultural differences, differences in, in food, in habits, only one similarity cannot bind a country together. Only religion cannot bind a country together, especially the eastern part of Pakistan and the western part of Pakistan. They were dissimilar to each other. And in 1957, Mohan Azad never knew 
that a new country would be born out of the out of this Pakistan. Bangladesh secede from Pakistan and form a new country. But what he said came true. Only religion cannot bind a community when all other things are different. And I shall end my lecture with a quote from the book India Wins Freedom. Mr. Jinha and his followers did not seem to realize that geography was against them. Indian Muslims were distributed in a way which made it impossible to form a separate state in a consolidated area. The Muslim majority areas were in the northwest and northeast. These two regions have no point of physical contact. People in these two areas are completely different from one another in every respect except religion. It is one of the greatest frauds on the people to suggest that religious affinity can unite areas which are geographically, economically, linguistically and culturally different. It is true that Islam sought to establish a society which transcends racial, linguistic, economic and political frontiers. Islam tried to. But history has however proved that after the first few decades or at the most after the first century, Islam was not able to unite all the Muslim countries on the basis of Islam alone. So that was the blunder that the leaders of the Muslim League committed. But I want to add that it was not a blunder. Perhaps they knew it in their heart of hearts. But perhaps they wanted to have a separate state where they could become the president, prime minister and other dignitaries without competing with the larger sections of the Hindus. The Hindu community, the Hindu leaders definitely had their faults, faults galore, mistakes galore. And this is a mistake. This is a mistake about which books can be written. The Hindus and the Muslims and the Sikhs having, have been living on the same land for centuries. But still they could not come close to one another. What is the reason? I think the majority community should be at fault. The responsibility with the majority community is definitely greater. The majority community failed to understand the Muslims. They failed to win over them as their brothers. And there is always hatred, mistrust, distrust among the communities. But it has been said, history is a lesson to the present and a warning to the future. Unfortunately, history has not been a warning and still we are staggering with the same problem. But once again, before I end my class, I want to remind everybody, especially to my students, that we should have the guts and the power of free thinking like Molana Abul Kalam Azad. We must have the courage to say what you think right. We, have, we must have the courage to condemn what we think wrong. Only then this book India wins freedom will be a book necessary for us all the Indians 
and only 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 then only then alone only then Ulana Abul Kalamazad paid respect by us. Thank you.